Hello class, Professor Mandeville here, lecturing today from my home office instead of the Champlain Memorial Library. And uh, what we're going to talk about in this first lecture today uh, are the Plains Indians. And this material that we're going to cover in these next several lectures is contained in your textbook uh, in Chapter 16 on pages 622 through 631. And uh, first of all, we, you know, we want to focus in on the Plains Indians because, uh, as you'll find out if you already don't know, they're going to be at a state of war with the United States government from approximately 1870 to 1890. Uh, and uh, they are the focus of most attention played to the history of the West, especially Native American history. And uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about these people, how they lived, what they were about, so you can understand what's happening to them. Now, the Plains Indians, and you can refer to uh, people of Native American descent or indigenous people as Native Americans, indigenous, or Indians. I have a lot of Native American or Indian friends, and they've told me, quite frankly, they don't care. So... The Plains Indians lived, obviously, out in the Great Plains. And a lot of anthropologists like to refer to them as the Great Buffalo Cultures because their entire lives revolved around the great herds of buffalo that existed out in the central part of the United States, the Great Plains. And in fact, we know in 1865, at the end of the Civil War, because the government sent scientists out to try to figure out how many buffalo lived on the Great Plains in America. There were 15 million head of buffalo roaming the plains in April, or excuse me, in 1865. <clears throat> and as far as Plains Indians are concerned, at this point in history, there were approximately, approximately 200,000 of them. So that's an awful lot of buffalo to go around for these people. So they basically still had it made. Now, as I mentioned, they're the great buffalo cultures because their lives, uh, you know, revolved around the buffalo. And these are the Native Americans that you're most familiar with from Hollywood movies and so forth. They lived in teepees, which were made of buffalo hide. Today, if you go to a powwow, Typically, the teepees are going to be made of canvas. These were made out of buffalo hide that the Native Americans, Plains Indians, uh, tanned themselves. And uh, they used to follow the great herds of buffalo. Because the buffalo migrated in a big giant circle. In the, nor in the summer months, they were in the northern Great Plains. Because that's where the luscious grasslands were. In the winter months, they were in the southern Great Plains, down in far south into Texas even, because that's where the best food for them was. And all of the Great Plains Indians, that you'll see their names scattered around the maps of the Great Plains, were not sedentary. They didn't stay in the same place. They had places they called their homelands, but they were constantly migrating, following the great herds of buffalo. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned before, they are the buffalo cultures, dependent on them for their livelihood. And in fact, it was even a centerpiece of most of their religions, too. They depended upon the buffalo for their homes, as I already mentioned, the teepees. They depended upon the buffalo for clothing. They had different ways to tan buffalo hides. They could tan them into very soft material like deer skin to make pants and moccasins and shirts out of. Uh, they could also tan winter kill buffalo and leave the long winter coat on them and use those hides for winter coats and blankets. So they had several different ways of tanning the hides of these uh, great animals. Uh, they obviously depended upon the buffalo for food. It doesn't take much of a hunt to feed a lot of people. I don't know if you've ever been around a live buffalo, but they're gigantic. They 
you know, make your typical beef cattle look tiny. So you don't have to be too successful to feed a lot of people. So they would eat the meat fresh. They would also preserve it by sun drying it into a jerky as travel food. And it provided them with a lot of food. Now they also utilized every single part of the buffalo. They utilized uh, the tendons of the buffalo for the strings on their bows. <clears throat> they would fashion knives and other tools out of buffalo bones. Uh, they would take the horns and hooves of the buffalo and melt them down in a pot and make a glue-like substance out of them that they uh, used to waterproof their teepees. Pretty ingenious. And believe it or not, they even utilized the proverbial buffalo chip. That is what they burned as fuel. Now, I know a lot of people are kind of shocked or even grossed out about that, but you can't confuse buffalo dried manure or chips, as they're known, with dairy cow manure that they spray out on the fields today. They have nothing in common whatsoever. Buffalo chips dry into chips out in the hot sun of the Great Plains, and they were collected by Plains Indians. They were collected by pioneer people. Homesteaders used them for fuel. And basically, they're just processed grass. And when you burn them, I've been around them before, uh, they just smell like burning grass. So they heated their teepees with buffalo chips. They cooked over them because you got to remember where they live. The Great Plains. I don't know if you've ever been to Kansas and Nebraska, but there are no trees. So you don't go and chop firewood to cook over or heat your homes with. So these people had it made. There were plenty of buffalo, but that's going to change over this time period <clears throat> of uh, when these wars are happening between the United States government and the Plains Indians. Now, the reason why the United States government sent scientists out to the Great Plains to estimate how many uh, head of buffalo there were is because they're already uh, presenting problems for railroads. And remember, we were in the process of building the first transcontinental railroad uh, in 1868, 1869. And uh, these buffalo, if they crossed the tracks, they could uh, delay trains for up to eight hours. And because there were single herds that were more than a million animals. And you don't just go plowing through a herd of buffalo. It'll derail a train. So the scientists estimated there were 15 million head in 1865. Uh, then uh, something alarming is going to occur by 1883. The United States government had commissioned a brand new coin, commonly known as the Buffalo Nickel, where it has the portrait of a Native American on the front and a buffalo on the back. Uh, the artist who was going to do the engraving for the coin to be struck with wanted to be inspired by a live buffalo in the wild. So in 1883, he traveled out to the Great Plains to find some subjects to draw sketches of. Uh, he searched and searched for a couple weeks and couldn't find a buffalo anywhere. So he returned back east, reported this to the federal government, and ironically enough, the buffalo that uh, he used as a model for the buffalo nickel was a buffalo at the Bronx Zoo. So, uh, the government in 1885 sends another team of scientists out to figure out where the hell are all the buffalo. And they came back with some very alarming information. They estimated that there were a fewer than 1,000 head of buffalo left. So, in a 20-year period, we went from 15,000 head of buffalo 
to less than a thousand. How could this happen? Native Americans get really hungry and hunting them out? I don't think so. <clears throat> there are many theories as to what happened to them, and there are some plausible explanations. Uh, some of them, uh, a large number of them, were killed to feed the railroad crews. Buffalo Bill was a buffalo hunter. He and his team used to go and hunt buffalo and deliver fresh meat to the railroad crews out west. <clears throat> buffalo meat became a delicacy back east, but the only problem was what they served in the restaurants was only what would be considered the filet mignon or the back strips off of buffalo and buffalo tongue. So a lot of buffalo were slaughtered for restaurant use back east, and they'd leave the entire rest of the carcass out in the sun to dry and rot. Then a year or so later, people would go around and collect giant mountains of buffalo bones that would then be ground up into bone meal, which is an additive to soil for farming. <clears throat> you also had the situation of the United States Army. There is a lot of uh, evidence that they purposely slaughtered and killed the herds of buffalo so it would be easier to conquer the Plains Indians, take away the centerpiece of their life, and they'll be lost. And that's exactly what happened. It's documented that General Philip Sheridan of Civil War fame, you may, uh, if you've studied the Civil War, he was the general in the Shenandoah campaign. There's a statue of him on horseback out in front of the New York State Capitol in Albany. He's a New Yorker. He was a career soldier. After the Civil War, he was a general out west. And he issued commands to his troops to kill every buffalo that they saw. Because in his words, a dead buffalo was a dead Indian. The United States government was involved in this. And it's tragic, not only for the buffalo herds, but for the Native American people who started to starve to death by the 1880s. So, this is all going on while we're at a state of war with the Plains Indians out west in a struggle for land. Because you got to remember, this entire continent was... Native American land at one point, and Europeans over the course of <clears throat> 300 years rustle away the overwhelming majority of that land from the Native people. So, uh, there are a lot of different conflicts that go on. We're going to just hit a few of them, and the first one that we want to talk about is pretty typical of what happens to these Native people out west. And that's the famous Sand Creek Massacre that happened in the Colorado Territory in 1864. Now, this involved, the Native American people this involves are the Southern Cheyenne, whose native lands were in southern Kansas. They had a very prominent chief. His name was Black Kettle. Black Kettle and his people saw the writing on the wall by 1864. Kansas was a state growing like a weed that they needed to do what a lot of other Native American tribes were doing, enter into a treaty negotiation to preserve some of their land through a treaty with the federal government. Now, uh, they will contact the federal government and the federal government will agree to meet with them and they tell them to travel to Fort Lyon, which is just over the border between, back then, the state of Kansas and the Colorado Territory. So, Black Kettle and his entire tribe travel to Fort Lyon. Because one thing you need to understand about these people they're very democratic in nature. So if they're going to make this lasting binding agreement with the federal government concerning their future and their land, they're all going to be part of it. They're all going to vote on it. Certainly tribal leaders will negotiate with negotiators from the United States government, 
but then they'll take back what they're about to agree to to their people and they vote on it. <clears throat> so the government told Black Kettle and they gave him an American flag and told him the following. While you're traveling from southern Kansas into the Colorado Territory, always have one of your warriors out front holding this American flag on a staff or a pole. That way, any U.S. military that comes in contact with you will initially know you're coming in peace, that you're friendly. Because remember, 1864, the Civil War is still going on. <clears throat> so, they do that. And they're also told when they encamp at night on their way there, fly the flag over their camp and it'll guarantee safe passage. Well, what's going to happen shortly after they cross into the Colorado Territory, <clears throat> they will encamp for the night in a dry creek bed known as Sand Creek. At this point in the year, there's no water in it. It's a good place to camp out of the wind. And that's where they encamp for the night. They do exactly what they're instructed, fly the American flag over their camp. It's worked like a charm. They don't post sentries or anything. They feel very safe. Well, that was a mistake. In the middle of the night, at approximately 4 a.m., a group of the Colorado Territorial Militia led by a former army colonel by the name of Shivington, will be out on a patrol of the Colorado Territory. In other areas of Colorado, there'd been some conflict with tribes native to Colorado. So they're this territory uh, unit, similar to what would be the National Guard today, out on patrol. They come upon... Black Kettle's encampment. And Colonel Shivington, a formi, former army colonel who knew damn well what that American flag meant, ordered his men uh, to have an all-out attack on a sleeping encampment. All these Southern Cheyenne were in their tents fast asleep after a long day of travel, and they're preparing for another the next day. And the orders that he gives to his men, which will later come out in his trial, are the following. He tells them to skill, excuse me, kill and scalp all big and little because nits make lice. And with that command, they went storming into a sleeping encampment firing their guns through the walls of these teepees. Startled awake, people would awake, stand up, be shot in their teepee. It took a while for the warriors to gather their wits, gather their weapons, and repel Shivington and his men. But when the smoke cleared, 400 Southern Cheyenne had been brutally murdered in this event. So, a few days later, what's left of Black Kettle and the Southern Cheyenne, miraculously he survived, limp in to Fort Lyon in Colorado. Report what had happened to him in the United States Army is furious. They arrest Colonel Shivington, and he's put on trial. But the trial takes place in the Colorado Territory. It cannot be a U.S. military trial because these are not officially sanctioned U.S. Army personnel. So they're tried in the Colorado Territory. During the testimony, his horrible orders come out because there are several men who refuse to participate in this. They watched in horror. They were not going to be part of this murder, which it was. Uh, others testified that Shivington and most of his men not only had they been riding all night, they'd been drinking alcohol all night. So they, many of them were drunken when they staged this attack. Not that that makes an excuse, but it might explain why they were such idiots. So, 
when the trial goes to jury and they come back with their verdict, Shivington is found not guilty. Had this been a military trial, he'd have been uh, in the brig for the rest of his life, and so would have many of his men. But they weren't part of the United States military. They were tried by a jury of Shivington's peers. You can rest assured there was not a single Plains Indian on that jury. And that's the way these people felt about Native people. You got to understand that back in this day and age, there were a lot of Americans who thought that Indian people were nuisances. They were in the way of progress. And some even tried to claim they weren't even really human beings. They were a subspecies, if you can believe that. Hard to believe, but some people actually fell into that trap. I guess times don't change much, do they? So, uh, that's the sad story of Black Kettle in the Southern Cheyenne. I'm going to take a short break here. And the next thing I'm going to tell you all about is the very famous battle, a little bighorn. So I'm going to take a break. I'll be back shortly. Talk to you in a few.